Let's uh, take out our Bibles, if you have them ready this morning. We're going to be heading to Matthew uh, chapter 5. And we are, of course, uh, continuing our series this morning, uh, The Jesus Way, Living the Jesus Way, focusing on how we're called uh, as God's people to, to, to not be of the world, but sent into it as salt and as light, and living by a different uh, set of values, if you like, uh, kingdom values, the values that Jesus outlined for us in what scholars have called his manifesto of the kingdom here in Matthew chapter 5, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And if we are to be salt and light, if we are to live the Jesus way, there is no part of our lives that this does, does not touch and impact and have an effect on, whether that's our family life, whether that's our work life, whether that's for studying, whether that's our online life, whatever aspect of life, where to be salt and light, there's no part of our lives that, that uh, following Jesus does not touch and impact. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. I uh, will just pray at this point before we launch into it this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, just the, the truth and the life and the light that we find within its pages. Thank you that it is a firm foundation on which to build our lives. Thank you that it is living and active. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would breathe life into these words that I speak this morning. I ask that you would uh, cause our hearts and our ears to be open to hear and receive what you would be saying to us today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. It's not really a word that you hear much these days. And I would suggest that this quality and value of meekness is quite under, misunderstood in our fast-paced, busy, get-yourself-ahead, 21st century modern Western life. And if we're honest, we're probably not particularly keen on that word being used to describe us. Oh, they're just a bit meek, you know. At a family event yesterday, uh, my brother-in-law asked what I was preaching on this morning, and I said, oh, I'm preaching on blessed are the meek, meekness, and he was like, oh, you, you drew the short straw, didn't you? It's kind of one of those areas, like, oh, he's like, oh, you can send me the notes, see, what you, see where you go. But meekness has connotations in our modern society of, of passivity. Sometimes you kind of think of it as weak, milky tea, just kind of nothing really much to it. It has connotations of spinelessness. It's, it's painted a picture of sum, submissive and ineffective kind of people. But that's not what meekness is at all. And I believe that there is something significant for us to see and grab hold of around this call to be meek. That is so important for us as we seek to live the way of Jesus in the cultural moment that we find ourselves living in. Of course, by, by way of uh, context and background here before we delve too much into it, Jesus is proclaiming this masterful sermon against the backdrop of a nation in bondage to the Roman Empire. And so this idea of meekness being a desirable quality or characteristic or virtue was most likely as foreign to the Jews in their cultural context as it is to us in ours. That's because the Jewish people were, of course, looking for a Messiah to lead them in the overthrow of the Roman Empire. They had this kind of notion, this idea that the Messiah, the one who would come to, to rescue and redeem, would come with a spirit of uh, domination, a spirit of conquering that which was oppressing them at that time. 
And they thought that conquering the earth through military power and might was the way to do it. Was, this was how it was going to be done. But God's way of living usually contradicts the world's way. God's kingdom is organized differently than worldly kingdoms. And we know that Jesus didn't come to overthrow the government. He came to reveal a kingdom. He came not to enforce and impose and take over from the top down. He came having laid aside his throne and glory to lift up, to bear up. He came not as a dictator. He came as a servant. He came not to tear down and rally against the ideologies that were contrary to his kingdom. His protest, if you like, was to go low, was to serve and not be served, was to seek and save the lost and the broken. He came not so much in the political spirit, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. He came to wash the feet of his disciples. He knelt down in the dirt and the dust with the broken. And ultimately humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. So what is meekness? What does it mean to be meek? I've mentioned, of course, already how meekness isn't all that perhaps popular or desirable by the standard and definition of culture. Can I just say that we probably don't want to go by cultural definitions? It hasn't and doesn't usually go well. We want to go by biblical definitions. And if Jesus saw it, to, saw it fit to include it as he outlined his values for life in the kingdom, we should take note of what he was saying, what he was calling his followers into. So to start, to begin to paint a little bit of a picture of what it means to be meek. Well, the opposite of meekness according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is defined as egotistic, pompous, haughty, and aggressive. None of those values or qualities sound particularly desirous either, do they? The opposite of those things, humility, gentleness, self-control, are beginning to get us on the right track of what meekness actually means. One theologian put it this way, That meekness is not weakness, but rather it is the gentle spirit, the disciplined or the controlled spirit. It denotes self-control, but also means genuine humility. Barclay's uh, New Testament commentary puts it this way. The God-controlled life, that's in essence what meekness means. There's a particular uh, Greek word used for meek here, padawos, probably not quite the right uh, pronunciation, apologies, I did listen to it on Logos before, my apologies for those um, here this morning, for those Greek speakers. But there's a particular word that is used here for meek that had three main uses or definitions. It was used as one of the great Greek ethical words. And in fact, the philosopher Aristotle, he would define, he had a practice of defining each virtue as the happy medium between two extremes. For example, the virtue of generosity would be the happy medium between the frivolous spender and the stingy miser. So meekness, he would define as the mean between excessive anger at one end, and indifference. The right amount in the middle was this word translated as meek. One who is always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time, never indifferent when there is injustice, able to keep this strong emotion in check. Not selfish anger, for selfish anger is always a sin. And it's interesting if we reflect on that, Because if we look at the life of Jesus, who of course was uh, known as one who is meek and gentle and humble and uh, a model to follow after, you know, we see him stooping down to to wash his disciples' feet. We see him uh, dining with 
with tax collectors and sinners. We, we see him kneeling down in the dust for that, you know, that woman caught in adultery. And yet there's this wonderful picture <clears throat> where uh, in the temple, the money changes, the lenders, all that kind of stuff that was going on in his father's house. And there's this, this picture of Jesus getting a little bit kind of stirred up about what's going on in his father's house. He begins to turn over the tables. He begins to drive out those who were buying and selling there. He was blazingly angry, but it was a righteous zeal at the dishonor of his father's house and his father's name. What's the relevance? What's the point for us today? Well, if we're wanting to live the Jesus way, to live in a way different to the pattern of this world, we need to grasp this virtue, this quality of meekness and what it actually is. For how often in our humanity, in the culture that we live in, we love to react. We love to get angry. We love to protest. We love to push back. We love to rise up. We love to get easily offended and react in a way that is not constructive at all. I won't ask for a show of hands this morning. But meekness means to not be provoked easily, but to respond in a different way. Meekness is not indifference, but our hearts being stirred by the things that are important to the Lord. Another standard use and meaning of this particular Greek word, it referred to an animal being broken in. That was one of the word pictures it was used for. An animal being trained having learned to accept control. It refers to power under control. The picture of a, of a horse, for example. And now, I don't know about you, I, I like horses. I think they're wonderful creatures, uh, majestic creatures. But I've always been a little bit wary, even a little bit scared of, of horses. Because there is, pow there is power there. They're big and muscly and powerful creatures, right? They can do a lot of damage. They can throw you off. They can do damage with their hooves if you get in the wrong place. Powerful creatures. Yet, when you see a horse that has been broken in, they're like able to do anything, respond to the, the word of the master or the trainer. There is a yieldedness and a responsiveness to the one who has broken it in. It's this picture of power and strength under control. So meekness means exercising God's strength under his control, demonstrating power without harshness, present, possessing gentleness. And the English definition of this word meek often lacks the blend of gentleness and strength. For us, it means a yieldedness to the Lord instead of doing our own thing or wanting our own way. How often can we be using our own strength or power or position, whatever that may look like in wherever God has placed us, to get ahead or to push our own agenda or to, to kind of use others or trample on others? Yet meekness looks different than this. It looks like strength under control, not strength seeking control. There is an aspect of gentleness around this word meekness. A third use of this particular Greek word translated meek is true humility, which banishes all pride. We read in Scripture, don't we, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And without true humi humility, there can be no true faith, because all true faith begins with a sense and a realization of our own need of God. I would put to you this morning that Jesus' call to be meek is not just a nice sentiment, not just some nice idea, not just a good teaching that turned a few heads back then and possibly here and now, but that he modeled and lived it perfectly. All the meanings of this particular word that I've just mentioned, Jesus lived and modeled. And I wonder what the world would look like 
If God's people grabbed hold of Jesus' call to be meek and followed his example of being meek, perhaps it would look like a little bit more like the Jesus way. A minister and theologian from the 19th century, Robert Johnston, he had this insight on meekness. He says, I do not know that at any point the opposition between the spirit of the world and the spirit of Christ is more marked, more obviously diametrical than with regard to this feature of character, than with regard to meekness. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, we read this. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of of God. Everyone take a breath. Some heavy stuff there, right? I don't know about you, that looks like a picture of the opposite of this call to be meek. As the, uh, the quote I just read out, there's, there's this diametrical opposition between the spirit of the world and the spirit of Christ. We live in a world where anger, where strife, where hostility abounds, whether it's online, whether it's on the road driving, whether it's on the news, whether it's in the home. And it's not the happy medium, but the excessive, unrestrained kind. You know, if we, we read a scripture like this, or we read some of the statistics in this, these kinds of areas, and they are mind-blowing. Online bullying or abuse, the statistics say that well over 50% of people and dare say more and more with each passing year, taking into account the, the effects of social media. But well over 50% of people have experienced hate, vitriol online. According to one study, 74% of people have experienced some sort of road rage. Or the area of domestic violence, the statistics say that one in three women have been subjected to physical and or emotional and sexual abuse or violence by a partner. And this is something that I think we can't just say, well, it's just out there, unfortunately, in the church as well. Husbands, fathers, men particularly, would we heed the call that Jesus issued and that he himself modeled to meekness. It's not spinelessness, it's not weakness, but rather strength manifested in gentleness, being under the control of the Spirit of God in our lives. We live in a world where self-assertiveness and self-interest is king. Getting ahead, no matter what the cost, is the way. Using people rather than serving people. Strength seeking control rather than strength being under control. And a world where self is at the center. Recently, um, my wife and I, we watched this show. It was like a, a documentary series, I guess. And it kind of followed this uh, real estate firm in Manhattan in New York. And uh, amazing properties on sale. Like some of the price tags are just eye-watering. But what was really fascinating to me, and as the show went on, it became more and more so, that it was like this study in what it looks like for people, and they'd interview different agents and things like that, what it looks like for people uh, purely living with mammon and money as their God. Purely living with status and position and getting ahead and, you know, getting a name for themselves being the driving force of their lives. And it was unapologetically so. It was, it was, it was amazing. It was actually a really interesting kind of study at, at what it looks like when, when the things of this world become the God and the pursuit and the driving force in people's lives. It was without restraint. It was out, without regard for 
those around them. There was no thought given to those who were being trampled down in their pursuit of profit and commission and sale and status and name and all those things. And I'm watching this and I kept saying to Steph, like, oh, this is, you know, it's quite a fascinating study of, of what it looks like when mammon and status is God and the pursuit of our lives. And in fact, it's the very opposite to how Jesus would call us to live. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, but the world perhaps would say, blessed are the powerful. Jesus challenges the very selfishness and self-centeredness that determines so much of our behavior. Surely there is a different way. The vision in Jesus' heart for what life in the kingdom would look like. In Mark chapter 10, verse 35 to 45, there's this account of the request of James and John. And this story, this account has always fascinated me. James and John, they come up to Jesus and they say to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Sorry, what? Sorry, this is like Jesus here. We want you to do whatever we ask of you. And Jesus is like, okay, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus goes, well, you don't actually really know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said, yes, we're able He goes on to say, yes, yep, okay, you will be, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. They come and and they say, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. I don't know about you, but it's somewhat encouraging because even the disciples hadn't quite got it. Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem at this point. He's heading towards the cross. He's uh, walked and lived his life in meekness. He's revealed the Father's love. He's revealed the kingdom of God to this broken world. And he's going ultimately to give up his very life. And here James and John come sidling up. They're wanting to get ahead. They're wanting to leverage their position as members of Jesus' inner sanctum to their own advantage. Sounds a little bit egotistical and haughty and pompous and aggressive to me, the very opposite of meekness. But Jesus uses it as a moment to teach a kingdom reality. He uses it as a moment to teach and to show his heart for what a life following his way should look like. It's to take the posture and a position of a servant, to go low in order to build others up. He says, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The way of the kingdom, the way of meekness, is to use whatever position, whatever strength, whatever power we might have, not to our own advantage, but to the advantage of others, to bear up, to build up, to lift up, to come alongside. What could this look like? What would it look like if we, as his people, grabbed a hold of meekness, of living with strength without being easily provoked, of living with gentleness when we could be harsh, of living with humility in a world that says, look out for number one, in looking to build others and bear others up and come alongside rather than just doing our own thing. Maybe this is something of what Jesus meant when he said that the meek shall inherit the earth. For an inheritance is a gift. It's something that is received, not earned or worked for. Maybe as we pursue meekness and allow the Spirit of God to work in our hearts and lives in this kind of way, it postures us to receive 
the blessings of the kingdom. The life, the peace, the hope that he would make available to us. In other words, all that God has for us. Not just for treasures in heaven, the future inheritance, although that is something we look forward to with joy, but here and now on earth. The blessed are the meek. How do we grow in meekness? Maybe Michelle, if you're happy to come and just play as we bring this to a close this morning. How do we grow in meekness? Three L's to leave us with. First of all, I'd encourage us to look and learn. To look to and learn from Jesus. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, Jesus says, Learn from me, for I am gentle. This word there, gentle, is the same Greek word used for me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. Look to and learn from Jesus. There's an invitation from him that we might be able to rest from our striving. To rest from our need to be in control. To rest from this need to have it all together. To to make our own way. Look to Jesus and learn from Him. For He modeled this meekness perfectly. He wasn't a pushover by any means. Or in Philippians 2, where we read the King of glory who emptied Himself and took on the very nature of a servant, making himself nothing, humbling himself to death on a cross. This Jesus who prayed in the garden in agony, not my will, but your will be done. You know, it says in one of the Gospels that in that moment of prayer, it's like, hey, do you not think I could have called a legion of angels to come? And deliver me from this hour, but how would Scripture have been fulfilled? That right there is power under control. Yieldedness to the Father's will. Keep coming back to Jesus. Keep our eyes and our focus and our attention on Jesus. Look to Him and learn from Him and we will see meekness. Not in the sense of the way that it has kind of come to mean in our our modern culture, but the way that it truly is. Power, gentleness, humility, and strength. Look and learn. Look Look to and learn from Jesus. Secondly, how do we grow in meekness? Lay hold of His power. Ask the Holy Spirit. We need His help. It is, of course, a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, it says, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. This word for gentleness is the same word used here, and blessed are the meek, for this word meek. It's the result of His work in our lives. If we're wanting to live in step with the Spirit, let's bring to Him those areas where perhaps we are not currently very meek. Those areas where perhaps there is a lack of self-control. Those areas where perhaps there's anger that's not restrained or controlled. Where there's perhaps pride or self-centeredness or selfishness. Maybe those areas where there is harshness instead of gentleness. We read in Scripture in Peter, First Peter, his divine power has given to us all things, all that we need for life and godliness. For life and God, that, that covers a lot. For life and godliness. He's given to, his divine power has given to us all that we need for life and godliness. Lay hold of his power, for it's the spirit that produces meekness in the heart of a yielded Christian. So look to and learn from Jesus. Lay hold of his power. The third L kind of is go low. 
seek to go low. Super practically, what ways can we serve this week? Our families, our work colleagues, our neighbors, our friends. What ways can we come alongside to bless, encourage, and support? And of course, in relation to our walk with the Lord, keep coming to Him, acknowledging our need of Him. That without Him we are nothing or have nothing. It's clear that Jesus' call and intention for his people to be meek has far more depth and meaning than what it has come to be defined by in our current cultural context. This is Jesus of whom it was said in 1 Peter chapter 2 that when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. That when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. This is the one who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. This is the one who invited his followers, you and me, into the way of meekness, following his example. In this world of anger, rebellion, pride and self-centeredness, enter the meek. Those who are walking in the path of self-control, those who are walking in the path of true strength, the kind that is yielded and under His control. Those who are walking in the way of humility and gentleness by the power of the Holy Spirit to turn what's normal and expected in the world around them on its head and receive all that God has for them. The Jesus way is the God-centered, the God-oriented, the God-controlled, the God-yielded life. Blessed are the meek. Would you stand this morning as we finish our time together? I'd invite the prayer team to come forward at this point as well. And one of the blessings of gathering together, yes, is worship and communion and gathering around the Word, but also this opportunity to receive prayer. Such a blessing to have someone stand with you, pray for you, pray with you. And so whatever the prayer need this morning, let me encourage you to avail yourself of that. But you know, a call to meekness can start here today can start with a response to the Lord and His Word. Perhaps, as we've been opening up the Scriptures today, as we've been looking at Jesus' invitation, maybe the Holy Spirit's been at work. Maybe there have been just areas that He's been perhaps putting His finger on, highlighting in your own heart and life. Areas not under control, His control. Areas perhaps that not currently defined by or characterized by meekness. Let me encourage you this morning to come and respond to the Lord. Come and do business with God. You can kneel at the front or at the side here. You can receive prayer. Come and and seek God that this this quality, this virtue of, of meekness, gentleness, strength, humility, The Spirit would begin to stir and work that in our hearts and in our lives. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this time together this morning. Would you work in our hearts that we would be meek in the true and the biblical sense of the word? Lord, in accordance with the vision that you had in your heart and that you have in your heart for your followers, Lord God. God, I pray that we would be marked, Lord, by, yes, your strength, but it would be yielded unto you. That we would be marked by humility, by gentleness. God, our hearts would be stirred by the things that are important to you. 
pray that we would live in this world with a, a different spirit, Lord God. That we would follow your example, Lord Jesus. That we would go low and seek to serve, seek to walk in the Jesus way. Help us to look to you and learn from you. Help us to lay hold of your power. As we go from here this week, Lord, would you be causing your word to just resonate in our hearts? Lord, where there perhaps are areas in our lives, Lord, that don't currently look very meek, Lord, would you do what only you can do? Lord, as we bring those things before you this morning, I, I thank you, Lord, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That, Lord, you desire to bring your freedom. You desire to be at work in our hearts, making us more like Jesus. So, Lord, I bless each and every person here this morning. Lord, with your presence, with your grace, with your goodness, that, Lord, we would be a people marked by meekness, Lord. walking in your way and pointing to you, Lord God, wherever it is that you've called us to be. And I thank you for our time together. We bless and we honor you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.